actually, Loz, it's going to be quite therapeutic for me because there's probably stuff that's going to come out because I probably haven't been very happy for three years doing this. That's when you're speaking about people leaving. A lot of the time they're leaving because there is an ego element in there or of like, um, or an anger element. Those things never really serve you all that well. Uh, you know, I think with the United stand, it's, and I probably shouldn't be saying this on camera, but honestly, you know what? I think... Hello everybody and welcome back to another Goldbridge Meets where we talk about the story of YouTube football or general football content for fans and whether it's a good or a bad thing. I'm joined by Loz. Welcome back to good. the show. You're meeting me again. Yes, yeah. I'm meeting in, in you again. the space. You can meet somebody more time. than once. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah, can you? Yeah, yeah. you can. Okay. The, the, the space thing, get in the comments how many time we, how, how time, times we do it. But... Um, it's not really, it's a trap. It's a trap. It's not really about YouTube space. It's a, it's another reveal about the kickoff, the uncut version, <laughs> right, good. the true version, yeah. you know, the bonus director's cut where actually what, really what you said last time didn't happen. Yeah. Aliens came in. In fact, the, the, the mafia, yeah. we're not going to say from which country came in and Italian. basically said, if you don't break up, then your balls You're will be served dead. for breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Um, Newcastle and London, historically, a lot of tension between the two places, yeah. both wanted to kill me yeah so definitely. i had to leave that's what happened we're having a joke yeah but uh, what we're not gonna have a joke about is the football <laughs> space because a lot of people are were very interested in that last half an hour that we spoke about before yeah there seems like there were a lot of people who wanted to get into it a lot of people who were into it and also a lot of people who i guess if you watch it you've got like a vested interest do you know yeah. what i mean you just want football content to be good because there is an element of when you sit down, you don't really know what you're going to get sometimes on YouTube. Sometimes you get a good day. Sometimes you go, oh, today was a terrible set of videos from everyone across the board. Well, we're going to get into it because we were talking about this yesterday a little bit on WhatsApp. And I said, uh, you know, you it's almost like a therapy session because what I want to talk about is the story of football YouTube because we've been involved in it. And, as a, and, and I suppose, as the thumbnail says, we've created a monster. And I don't sure. mean me and you. Yeah. You know, Although, we have been in the lab, mm. but um, I'm, I'm talking AFTV, Red Men TV, you know, some of the forefathers and some of the new people as well. Have we created a monster? What do you think about it in the comments? Because uh, it's your it's your community as much as it is ours, of course. And where is it going to go? Because I was saying to you on WhatsApp yesterday, actually, Loz, it's going to be quite therapeutic for me because there's probably stuff that's going to come out because I probably haven't been very happy for three years doing this. Th as in... what? Uh, what, when you're on camera, off camera? like Just, I, th I, th I mean, I, I, I'm happy to get into it because that's the whole point of doing this sort of different content. But I'd just say, like, I did a show this morning, mm -hmm. absolutely got in the groove. You know what I was saying in the last video about, it's almost like when you're writing a, winning, a good album and people are like, oh, Goldbridge is so arrogant. But you can only be honest when you do this sort of thing. And I'm very passionate about content. So this morning, there was a, a, something in the news about Mason Mount, you know, and not being bought for footballing reasons. And I went, I hit live at 10 o'clock and I'm like, I love it. Love Steel it. Feel engaged. So I'm happy when I do content, probably 99% of the time. It's when I'm not doing the content that I think I've just, you know, been so close, like to just go, oh, I'm just going to walk away from it. I'm, I'm just getting really tired of it. And I think that's to do with the pressures that people don't see off the camera. You know, the people sure. that competitors, mainstream pressure, people that work for you, people that leave you, all that sort of stuff. So I want to get into that because I think it's definitely paralleled throughout this community that we've built. It's de there's definitely um, uh, what happens on camera and what happens off camera can sometimes not be the same. Yeah. And I think weirdly, like the assumption is that if you're on YouTube, then you're basically just being yourself on camera. Yeah. Which I've not really seen anything like, I've not really seen that many people who are all that consistent on and off camera, if that makes sense. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are incredibly consistent. There are a lot of people who are nice people on and off camera. But you, of course, you dial it up when you go in front of the camera a little bit. I also think... In our space, it's not like it's unusual that in media people are uh, out for themselves. Yeah, should we say? Yeah, that's just a that's business in life. That's kind of that's every industry. I think anyone's worked in. I don't know any industry where when you get into it, they don't go. There's a lot of backstabbing here, or there's a lot of like you know. There's very few places where you kind of just get in and they go, no, nope, just a bunch of lovely people. Even like the clowning industry. Mm. 
They all hate each other. Oh, I think this is a big thing as well. We're going to riff. We're going to go all over the place. But I suppose the overarching thing is the story of what we've created and whether you as well think it's a good thing or a bad thing to have this world that did not exist when I when I was growing up. I mean, I loved fan forums. I'd spend a lot of time on them. They're very, very slow. The concept of after a bad result, imagine going on a forum where you to- you have to create the, the topic yourself. So United were robbed. You write out, no way should Roy Keane have been sent off for punching Jason McAteer. The game's gone soft. You hit it up. You see if five people have read it. Are they going to leave a reply? You refresh it half an hour later. And, and that's your interaction to where we are now, where you can instantly get something and, you know, all the content that's out there. It is what I want to say is it's amazing. I think it is amazing what has been built from I what agree. I had. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, I think that I'm uh, maybe just to play devil's advocate. I think sometimes just interacting with a bunch of strangers that you don't know can sometimes be very rewarding because sometimes you share views and, you know, you don't know where those people are from and sometimes they connect with you in what feels like a more meaningful way than just them watching your video. But I think we have to acknowledge, you know, even the forum's a bit weird. I don't know if any of the forums that we were probably on when we were younger, I ever knew anyone's face or I ever knew that someone was really that person. Yeah. And maybe that maybe that doesn't matter. But I think the, the, the... the areas we exist in kind of craft us as people. And I think that's why when you're talking about you not being happy, I'm sort of like, is is part of you not being happy, not necessarily talking about football or any of those things, but just you being on the hamster wheel of having to make mm. content constantly in order to keep people engaged. And if you are to take a month off or whatever it is, how you know, whether YouTube will still be the same when you get back. That's whether a good point. whether you know, if you let the channel people go, this channel went dormant, it's never gonna come back. That is a real pressure on someone to just keep making content over and over again that's a very high quality or at least of a good enough quality that people are going to come back and watch it over and over and over again. And I think that's the sound of the world's smallest violin because people will go, oh, you know, you do quite well out of it financially. You've got millions of subscribers. But it's true. I remember speaking to Ellis Patton, who does Home Away Days, when I went down and he said exactly what you've just said there. It's like taking that break and not knowing what might be there when you come back and who comes in and takes your place. So I get that. Um, And I think that, look, uh, uh, just to go on what you were saying before about the clowning industry i remember in, in during covid talking about you know my unhappiness um in this uh, in what we do is that one of the big things that i'm massively frustrated about is uh, being a problem solver I've, every job i've had is about problem solving you know even being a detective i loved like there's your cctv this or how do we solve this problem solving is probably one of my favorite things so in covid um I had a couple of people reach out to me, like celebrities, um, and one of them was in the acting space. And I'm not a name because it's not fair, but um, needless to say, they've won an Oscar. No, they haven't. And uh, they basically were talking about that industry. And I was just like, yeah, everybody in COVID had their own mental health issues because it was challenging, you know, for kids and, and everybody wasn't at school. And I said, I just find this 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 thing I work in really hard how you know we've got something really interesting and innovative and it's so great and then there's people blocking it off all around the place and it's not just mainstream going don't want to work with you don't want to work with you it's people who who are, who are in what we do I mean look let's be honest on the kickoff I used to go on and didn't go on because someone was like don't use him don't yeah. use him and we're not going to name names for that but it's like it's really frustrating because I'm like if I'm in any other industry, they will get the best people together to be, to, you know, if you're trying to solve cancer, you don't go, don't walk with that Australian guy who's brilliant at solving cancer because I'm jealous of him. I don't want to, you go and get him over to the States or, or, or India wherever. or wherever you're doing it to build that. And 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 this 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 actor said to me, welcome to showbiz. The, you know, everybody who's at the Oscars, everybody who's like at the awards, ah, hate each other a lot of them it's so competitive because they're all fighting for the same roles and you know if DiCaprio gets the lead role in Wolf of Wall Street there'll be three or four other male actors that want really role. want that role I said just welcome you know what that's the world and that is something I really struggle with mm-hmm. and that, that that's one of my contributors to being unhappy is because I just think there's so much potential um and it can be a bit of a hamster wheel which I enjoy doing the content day to day but I think there's a lot of barriers that I just it's just so obvious to me. It's just so obvious to bar- break down as as we look at the future and the past. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that like um especially in any industry where content is being made, you can let's call those people the artist 
just because in a contract, you'd probably be called the talent. That's what you'd be called in a contract, right? I'm not saying it's because they're because we're artistic or because we're talented. It's just that's what people refer to them as. Yeah. And then there's the tension from the other side of the people who either control the purse strings or do the distribution or whatever it is. And there's never quite the right balance between the two. Sometimes like there's good working relationships that you have and they can be temporarily beneficial. But that, again, is pretty much the same as any other industry where they're, you know, you, very rare you'll get a one working relationship for your entire life where everything is going to go just as you want it. And in fact, those probably aren't the most rewarding relationships. Actually, a bit of tension in a relationship, disagreeing with someone or having to negotiate on price or any of these kind of things is part of growing and being better. And YouTube is definitely partly like that. TikTok's the same. Instagram's the same. You know, there's agencies that control some of the brand deals for all those three things. Most of that's just relationships. Mm -hmm. If you know the right person in the agency, the person goes, I like that person. That person's going to get this brand deal. Yeah. And the same with YouTube and things like that. Like, you know, I'm under no illusion that there are ways that Mr. Beast gets on the front page at YouTube or ways that the side men get on the front page at those places. It's very beneficial to have those people on the front page. I've, I, I mean, I've not had it with YouTube, but I have had it with another outlet where was that? part of the... Agree. Part of right. that Twitch part, is what you would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every well, video that, I did was right. on the front page, and that's like, part of the agreement that you get when you, if you're a big, um, if you're a big streamer or a big uh, face, and you go on Twitch, they're going to help you out because mm. it's in their interest. And it helps. It's by the way, it's also in their interest to just go. Mark Goldbridge is on this platform, by the way, because some people might not know, and so every ecosystem is slightly different. Every, it's weighted. It, yeah, and there isn't one hard and fast rule for the entire industry. You're not going to be able to sit here and go if you want to make it. You know, apart from hard work. There aren't really many other rules that we can sit here and go, this is what's going to get you to the top. Hard Apart from And consistency. Uh, Those yeah. two things, that's that's why, like, you know... That's why I'm saying. Great as you are, it, you know, a huge part of it is you're consistently delivering something that people can watch. And if you're having a bad day and you don't think it's a particularly good stream, there's probably someone out there who watches it and goes, I still got the Mark Goldbridge stream that I came for mm. and I still got partly what I wanted. Yeah. Tomorrow I I'll come back because tomorrow is going to be some better news or different news or do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And it's that kind of dynamic. I think what a lot of people don't understand about media and the, I even noticed in the comments on the video that we have, right? A lot of people didn't understand the human nuance of what was actually happening there. A lot of people went, Lawrence left, Lawrence did it because of one comment and that was all that happened. He left only because of a comment and that makes him a bad friend. Do you think some people, yeah, well, I, I read some of the comments. Some yeah. people did, yeah, yeah. And a few people I replied to and was like, and actually like last night, this guy messaged me and said, I actually deleted my comment because I didn't, I, I hadn't watched thought the video. through what I'd said. I just, <laughs> yeah, that was what, he, he hadn't thought through what he'd said and he was like, I, I didn't realise that I was just working off a load of assumptions. I thought, okay, cool. That's Grandma, the, if you're in the room, that, yeah. What does it mean when a left left footed predator falls to the ground? It means what I said was true. What's Aaron Ramsey done? Yeah. Um, Who, who's just died? But yeah, I mean, we'll keep it there just for, for you know, why, yeah. why bother? But look, it is the story of football YouTube and whether we've created a monster. And I think uh, there are going to be things where we riff off but um, and, and, and frustrations and positives. Um, I think one of the big things I really want to talk about is the, you know, the, the, the cycle of, of YouTube. You've experienced it, the kickoff, AFTV's experienced <laughs> it, um, United Stands experienced it, where content... You, you you find talent, it goes off and does its own thing. I've got an interesting sort of positive you've, you've on that. You've skipped a lot of the cycle there. Yeah, I've yeah. skipped a lot of the cycle yeah. there. But going back to the formative days, because what I, what we're really trying to establish here is we have created a monster in the sense that it's sort of it, it, it's um it's the wild west. It's sure. not you know mainstream is journalism is a set of rules that are probably 50, 60 years old that people still abide to and probably do need to be changed. Sure. You know, when I look at the weekend where, you know, the pile on to the United Stand for this interview with Rasmus, where apparently players were furious with Rasmus for doing the interview and he went, I'm really sorry, it won't happen again. And people pile on to the United Stand. What is this new toxic media? It's a joke. They shouldn't be getting access to players. And I'm like, well, hold on a minute. This is, you, you're the victim of... Um, a media feeding you something to take us down because they're scared of it. And that's the same whether it's whether you do the interview or Robbie from the AFTV. I think it's really great that those opportunities are there and the numbers are massive. But there are other aspects of it, which is just it's unpleased, it's un 
filtered and it's crap some of it and and where it's going to go in the future because i think it's an amazing space you know i think that uh, we've we spoken about the kickoff we, obviously i do the united stand you know the AFTVs, the red men red men i think was the first sort of fan content channel there's there's so many others who do great stuff as well but it's where it's going to go but the start of it was quite interesting i thought the, the start of it for what you, do you what do you think the start is well, the start of it for me was a Lilo in Mallorca lying there wow. going, these forums are getting less and less populated. What is this YouTube thing? Right. I thought there must be a way to go live on YouTube and talk to people about football. And that was the simple idea. But you you came but up with this idea of a margarita in... Yeah. Right. Uh, so I thought I'd invented fan content. Right. So go As, on. by the way, do most people in the fan content space. Exactly. Most uh, people in the fan content space go, well, if you really look back, it was... Me who invented this. Which is ridiculous. And we don't need to do that because you didn't. This is fun. You didn't. And um, so anyway, I, I go onto YouTube when I get back from holiday and I, I I find out there is this live stream thing and we start doing it once a week on a Sunday. And then being on there, you start to see that the, that, that the AFTVs and the Red Men's exist. And then I find out that there's a, there's a United channel that exists as well. And I'm like, hold on a minute. All I want to do is create content. Who runs this? I find out there's this guy who runs this and it's was Fremantle, wasn't it? And they own a lot of fan content. Well, so, uh, okay. So you skipped a, you skipped a bit of detail. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so you're, you're skipping ahead. That would have been what? 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's when I played the game. I came in, I, I'm off the bench. So, uh, 20, uh, 2009 was, Idea. I think when the, the first, red men upload was wow i think maybe they were uploading stuff before that but i think they formalized it in 2009 i know paul and chris have been making videos for a very long time so i don't want to talk about their story without them though i think robbie also claims he did something in 2009 okay i know i was doing football content on youtube in 2009 i've heard this story from robbie he was lying in bed one morning and i turned and over to him and i said that was <laughs> bloody amazing but yeah. we should start a youtube channel and then yeah. he sat on it for three years but yeah. he did have that idea in bed with Lars oh, in he 2009. Sat on it. Yeah. um it, yeah like I get, you know, Robbie, um, Robbie as well is obviously a different reflection of the industry that we're in. Like R Robbie was very much a businessman who saw a business opportunity and capitalized. And, you know, I, I respect what he's done with that business opportunity a lot. It's amazing what they built because there was a time where it was just like, it was, it was a word in football culture and, yeah and it still is and in, uh, but there was what? there was a time where that was just unbelievable so, like we weren't even doing fan cams and it was just like you're looking at those numbers and you're going just get some sort of camera outside old trafford and interview someone and it wasn't even for like get them to say something stupid it was literally just get a camera outside there and do it um that was kind of the you know that 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 happens a lot online hmm. people see people do and they go we could probably sell this. We can get people to click on this because it looks similar to AFTV or it looks similar to whatever else is big out there. It's fairly cheap to do. It's really cheap to send a camera outside a stadium. I, I think on that, you know, we'll riff again. I think that fan, con, uh, fan cams is exclusive to AFTV. I don't think, I think that is their thing. Robbie deserves credit for it. And it only really works because it's still, they still do it. They still chuck out 15 to 20. And that's always been his model to do that. And, you know, he created a lot of content, people coming through that, when you think about the DTs, the Troops, the Claudes, the Ties. Um, that, that, but, there are so many names that yeah, have built something I, off the back of that. I, I, but I, you know what? Having I never really wanted to do it. It's funny, actually. I was speaking to Robbie um, around that time, mm. and he was like, you need to be doing this. Mm. Um, and it was actually his cousin who ended up doing it for us. Mm. And we did it. And it was relatively successful, but I always found it really hard. You know, it would be like... The, the videos would come in, we'd edit them, we'd put them up, and they never really did what AF, AFTV did. Occasionally you would get a big hit, but it would be because we'd lost the game and somebody just with a squeaky voice would go, Game out! You know, it would be comedy. And I'd go, Is Yeah, that good? I, 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 no, I, I never liked it. I never liked it. And, and, and actually, Man United fans hated it. And they, so we got some feedback from some of the fan groups, and I think they expected us to go, We're going to do it. And I went, You know what? We're going to stop. COVID's sort wow. of the perfect time to stop doing it because wow. we don't want to do it anyway. But it worked really well for them. And I think that that was a creative niche that, you know, you think fan cams are for everybody, but I think it just really worked for 
AFTV. I think what's also good to acknowledge about Robbie, um, you know, the, the, especially the media industry is run by a lot of middle class white guys. And, you know, I'm sure they have their place in the industry. I'm sure everyone's got a place in the industry. It's a big industry. Robbie, like, gave a lot of people who uh, represented different communities and represented yeah. different looks and different uh, accents and all backgrounds. different... Backgrounds. Background, everything. Whatever you want to say, there was a difference. Obviously, it was a lot of men. You know, I'm sure there were some women mixed in there, but I don't think there were a lot of women. So it was a lot of men. So there is a, a thickening of the pie of people involved. I'm not saying men it encompassed everyone, but it definitely reflected more people than just, you know, someone sitting at whatever, doing whatever, and it was just, just them all the time, same person, all those kind of things. That's a different representation. And I think Robbie deserves credit for that as well. 100%. I'm not sure if it was as, I, you know, I know he was trying to appeal to certain people, but I'm not sure it was like a conscious kind of, oh, I'm going to bring diversity to the industry sort of thing. I think it just happens that way because Arsenal have got a very diverse fan base. If Robbie is a Luton fan, Luton fan TV never pops off. If Paul Wait, Machin, What are you saying? I'm, I'm going <coughs> to. I'm not a Forest fan. Yeah. Robbie's not a Luton fan. No, you know this. Is no, the but if he is, I'm just about. saying if he is, if yeah. he is. But it's the same. For, if you do Forest, you know, if you do the Forest stand or whatever it is, whatever the stand is at Forest, you frankly aren't in that position. And I think that's you know you know it's a great point though because I was thinking about this only the other week. I was like, you know, people say I'm a Forest fan because I'm from Nottingham and I went to a few games when I was a kid. Smart. I mean, you're going to judge kids of eight for going to, to I'll go anywhere I'll go yeah. to Solihull Moors I'm not bothered we're at Solihull Moors now yeah. but Here we are. but look I love football if I didn't support United and I supported Everton there is a ceiling I just do that so, oh hello I've done it anyway that's football like right. you know you, you you can still do it and um, it would just it would, it would have been a different route for you yeah, and yeah. I think it would have taken you a lot longer to build that's football yeah, if yeah. you hadn't have had a body of Manchester United fans who looked into that mm. that's, that's fine like it's not, you know, it's not a hard thing to acknowledge. You, you know, you worked really hard at this, and you've also shown you have great knowledge outside of just Manchester United. Not everyone can pivot from a one club thing to a multi club thing. That is, that's hard. But so fan camps were a big part of it, and then big media started getting interested because they went, okay, we could run YouTube. CPM was massive back then. We could run YouTube. You know, we can, we could own this IP. You know, we could own all these little channels. And that's where, when you're talking about Fremantle and those kind of companies, they came in and... This stunned me. It was... So it was basically, they owned one of every fan channel. So they had Spurs. I think it was called Spurred, Spurred On. Chelsea. They had Chelsea, which was uh, Rory. They had... Um, full-time Devils. Full-time Devils. And they, I think they had a couple, I don't think they had a Liverpool one, weirdly, which I think is very weird looking back now, but I think they saw that was already very strong in the space with Redmen. Yeah, Man I think they had a good relationship with Redmen, didn't they? The, the, they it, weren't signed, Redmen weren't signed with them. Redmen were signed with Ball Street at the time. That was another um, collection of people. And that was, I think Robbie was in that collection for a while. He was, yeah. And so I worked with Fremantle and I also worked with Ball Street. And I remember Football the, Republic, wasn't it, as well? Football Republic, which was like, that was that was their, that's football. Yeah, yeah. But it was like, this encompasses everything. And that was obviously where I met Brian. And, you know, we did lots of things on and off camera there. Um, and that was funded by Fremantle. Fremantle fund big TV projects. Well, they were sort of behind the X Factor, weren't they? Yeah, and lots of other little things. And, you know, I think in the same building was like Endemol and lots of other... There were lots of big production companies. And, you know, they saw this as like a digital arm Mm. of what they did in TV. And also, surprise, surprise, people will pay you to try to make some more money for them. So there were lots of people in that business who were kind of speculating that it was going to do something. Mm. So they dropped the ball, really, because they... So can I be honest? I spoke to a salesperson who left that company as the company was kind of winding down. And the guy went to me, can I tell you something? I've not been trying for ages. I've just been collecting a check. Yeah. And I and I remember thinking, you prick. Like, you know, as nice as it is that you can pay, he was like, I just want to pay my wife and kids. And I thought, okay, fair enough. He was on a fat check from someone. And he was like, it was good, even without the commission. I didn't really try. And I remember thinking, but you've done loads of, cool, you've survived. You've done loads of other people out of a job here. You've mm. let down loads of people who are relying on you to go out there and get sponsorship for all these things. And there was definitely sponsorship out there. Like Wall Street found big sponsorship from big betting companies. And they did an amazing job of bringing together lots of even smaller fan channels under an umbrella. You know, there were fan channels of Norwich, which was Jack Reeve. There were fan channels of Everton, which was uh, they're attached to the, the Red Men. There's fan channels for quite niche football channels who weren't doing big views, who were able to get sponsorship and pay for some of that content. And that is massive in the space. Robbie was a big part of that because he was like the 
the but, big boat that all yeah. the other little boats followed. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good. Um, but but it's interesting because look, people, this is the start of the football thing, and I came into it around 2014, and I was like, oh, there's all these other uh, outlets which I wasn't aware of, and interesting story. I was like, I found out that these were all owned by Fremantle, and I was like, this ain't fan content. I'm sorry, it's not. These people that have stood there are actually being paid by a TV company. It's not fan content. So do you think, is that where you draw the line? Yeah. Then? Well, so, well, that's what I did in 2014 because right. I was like, but well, this is not fan content right. because I'm going live in front of people on a Sunday night once a week with three mates on a live stream and we're just saying Fellaini's shit mm -hmm. and we need to buy this player and we need to give Van Hal time, etc. whatever. And that was fan content for me. And I found out that this was going on. And also what was very interesting at that time is, and I'm not saying that this is this is me, but to be honest, it, 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 we had a big part to do with it. The, you, had, you had your fan cams at, at the start and you also had a lot of 10 minute well-edited content. That's what people were doing. And I couldn't do that. I didn't have this ability to do that. So I was like, well, I'm just going to go live for 20 minutes and do a match reaction in my bedroom or whatever it was I was using. And it's interesting. And then I started doing watch alongs mm -hmm. and, you know, and then you, you fast forward years and everybody does live content now for many reasons. So, so that was really interesting as well. And, and it sort of changed how we did things and took it away from, I think what Fremantle were doing was this is fan content behind a TV company. Whereas actually, I think there was a lot of people that, you know, ended up being treated badly because of that. Um, and there was definitely an umbrella. I mean, I came in and I was like, maybe we could do something with Red Men. No, we do it with Full Time Devils. Oh, maybe I can do something with AFTV. No, we do it with Red Men. And, and it was like a real closed shop. And I was like, again, this is not fan content. So I ended up getting a contact with uh, Fremantle. Um, Neil, I can't remember his second name. And, he now uh, works for um, Hashtag, hashtag United. Yeah, yeah, apparently nice guy. Lovely wasn't, guy. Wasn't particularly to me. Oh, really? Um, he was okay. all right. He was all right. But I, I just remember saying to him, look, I'm starting something with this United stand thing. And I think, I think I'm good, you know, without being arrogant, I think I'm good. Can, can I get involved with that? And I basically said, well, you know, you've upset a few, of, a few of the, few of the people that work. And I said, but that's what we're doing. You know, this is how, this is it. We, 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 this is, this is content. This I is. I think I actually remember talking about that conversation with Neil. And he basically said, there might be something for you, but you need to get in line and respect those who are already here. And I was just like, Okay, that's all the motivation I need, and I'm not. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say he's 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 the reason that yeah, the understand is what it is. But, but I was sort of like, you know, when I when I look at my own happiness in this thing that we do, a lot of it is because of the stuff I have to do behind the camera. I don't want to be Alan Sugar. I don't want to run a business. I want to be in front of camera. I want to go to and do stuff like you know vlogs and stuff. Uh, you know, I want to go and do Goldbridge cooks. I want to do. People say, why don't you do Gold, Goldbridge cooking anymore? I don't have fucking time. Yeah, I don't have the time. I want to be a creative. It's ready meals. Yeah, I want to be a creative, but I'm also running businesses. Sure. And it's hard balance. There was a time at the start where it's amazing, but if somebody'd gone, come and work for this, mm. I'd be doing that, and someone else would be running businesses. Yeah, you and of course, that's kind of just how quickly you can hit, really, or how quickly you can make money and make it sustainable. And overheads get very big very quickly, you know, office space and all this kind of stuff. You need a space to shoot. Mm. You, were, I think you're quite fortunate in the sense you could run a lot of it from your house initially. Yeah. Or kind yeah, of, you yeah. know, you and, had and COVID opened up a lot of people to being able to do that as well. Yeah. But, but I mean, you know, even then it's like, you you professionalize it to a good degree. You have the mm. green screen or the the background that you've got, and you know the the graphics helped you quite a lot. And oh, the green screen was a was a lifesaver. Yeah, and a lot of people have followed that, and thankfully, you know, it, it had its time, and I think it's moved on from that a lot. But yeah, I think it was just a really really interesting time at the start. There was a lot of competition between people at that yeah. time. I I remember like I I was in, a lot of blocking. Because everyone knew that at, at, I think the the money tap was quite. Um, tight and people knew that there were limited deals out there to be gotten and, and like the la well you had it with kickoff I think Robbie had it with AFTV I mean that Ladbrokes deal I mean so, we can talk what we like about it actually we can say what we like it's fine um, it's if you want deal. if you want to sponsor us it's you know it's really but the but that Ladbrokes deal was like sort of like that was Indiana millions. Jones and the, the the Holy Grail or whatever it was in the cup it, it was it was a huge deal and, and again, people that, were sort of like going wow that was also down to relationships. Literally like that. Yeah. Well, that's wow. what I did. I, 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 there was, there was an did accentuation on the wow. And 
I think like they, you know, that was down to relationships. You I know, remember like, going to the kickoff. Sorry, people hate it when I interrupt you. No, and, and I will come back with the relationships. But I remember going to the kickoff and Brian being very proud of that Lapbridge deal and saying, you know, they were with such and such. They're now with us for much for bigger than much price. Bigger money. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a. I think again, it's like that. It kind of reflects the uh, na- like part of our national identity is that like we've been you know blessed in a way we've got like the the big man at the top has kind of given us some cash and it's like you know Brian was always very counter cultural and it was kind of an interesting moment for us because like the culture had sort of gone actually yeah we kind of like this like we're gonna make something official of it and to have be like faces of a brand is like a big thing for some people yeah yeah um that was just but again it's like that's a very specific part of the space i think the kickoff was massive in the, like that was like the dominating platform um for about a year maybe two maybe three years at a push um who do you think is the dominating platform now i think it's a bit more spread i it's think it's very diluted isn't it i think filthy fellas um they were originated a lot in the space they don't get spoken about very much i don't think their numbers were as big as some other people but their innovation and what they did and a lot of what they've come up with i think has been excellent that's like Poet and Tigo and um, Specs is a massive part of that and all those guys. Mm. Um, I think obviously, I think you are the biggest, I can't think of someone who does bigger numbers really. No, yeah, I think numbers wise, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I, that, uh, it's interesting because I, I, where I'm sort of moving through the years and we're going back and forward, it's like a bloody film I watched the other day, is that there's there's mistakes that are putting me into the now because I, I think that when you look at those formulative years, you move Fremantle out of the way. Mm-hmm. Everyone sort of goes independent then, don't so, they? Sorry, Fremantle basically ended that venture and tried to sell those things. I was, but not just me, Brian and I were offered the chance to buy the, all that as a network uh, for quite a low price. but So you'd have had all the channels? Bloody hell. And the, the kind of the chance to like revive them almost? I think we passed on it because it was not a great opportunity. And I think basically we felt like the kickoff and everything else was, the kickoff was going to be as big as the Football Republic or any of those things. Which is right. It's, it's correct, yeah. Um, and... The other channels were just kind of dead weight at that point. Like you were dominating in the space. The Redmen were. The channels weren't really built to any degree. They kind of, they, they. it was honourable what Neil and those guys were trying to do. They wanted to make a fan network. Obviously, they wanted to make money from it. But Neil had this, and he still does have this idea that in football, you can have like a really positive chat and that everyone can be a community. I think that's partially probably why he said things to you like, you know, you've kind of upset these people. Neil very much wanted everyone to like come together and be a bit of a thing. And, you know, Robbie was very much doing his own thing and it was a bit of a like, those two, I don't know if they got on, but like they certainly didn't agree on a lot of things. Then there was you. Then there was like Brian on the outside. There's some big names in there, all of which think they know what direction the space is going to go, all of which are competing for the same money or similar money. Mm. What's... I find it so weird looking back, like just how goldfish tank it feels that everyone's just like looking at each other and sort of like, well, I don't like that or I don't like this guy, I don't like that. And actually the only people who benefit from that are the big corporations, the mm. big the people with the big money, because they can drive our price down. They can come in and go, well, we want this, this and this. And because they tomorrow they could go, well, if we don't do it with the kickoff, we'll do it with Robbie. Everyone kind of goes, yeah, okay then, all right. There was a point where, uh, and I think Brian's already told this story, but on the kickoff where Labrooks or the people at the head of it wanted to own the IP of the kickoff. And that was like central to the deal. And they were really, really intent on it. And Brian, credit to him, was also really intent on them not owning the kickoff as IP. Because if we wanted to walk away from the deal or we built something up, what we meant to do, we just like, we walk away with nothing. Mm. That's not fair. And basically bottomed out the deal. It was a like a big multi-million pound deal that was on the table. And he was like, no, I'm just not going to do it. And I remember like they got frustrated and in the end they just ended up kind of walking away, but in a like a not particularly nice way. Like they they kind of indicated they were going to sign the deal and then they didn't sign the deal. That's the way the industry is, is like, it's not, I think a lot of people from the outside wanted to be this clean, the story is told as such, you know, 
you and Brian were friends or you and uh, McCola don't get on or you and Rory uh, don't get on or you and whoever don't, or me and these guys don't. It's not that clean. Like these are real people involved and like a huge part of business is perception. And I don't think people are, are really prepared for it as well. You know, you look at Brian's background, you look at my background, you look at anybody's background in this. Nobody really, with the exception of you know, maybe Rory from EastEnders, has any showbiz background. And that is authentic and that is its strength. But I look at that evolution from the start to probably having three big hitters, you know, kick off FTV and what I was doing with United Stand to where we are now, where, you know, it's a it's, it's very, very diluted. I, I, look, I started looking at it probably four years ago and I was like, we're getting it wrong. We're, get, we're definitely getting it wrong. There's, I don't see any other channel as a threat and that's not because of numbers. I'm just sort of like, well, we're doing it long enough now. If you're going to, if it's going to fall off, I'll see it in the numbers. And the numbers are so big, aren't they? The numbers are so big when you look at what was going on with the kickoff and AFTV and, and et cetera. You've got all these big numbers. And I just think where it is now and the future of it, I suppose there's two questions. One, is is whatever it is good? And two, what is the future of it? Because I just think that there's hmm. such an opportunity there around the real talent to take on the mainstream. And we mentioned it on the last show. I think that what, because we've dithered, quite rightly, the mainstream and some people who work in the mainstream have adapted. And, you know, you look at something like what the overlap's doing now, absolutely killing the space. And I look at it and I look at the numbers and I go, look, there's nothing better than watching Gary Neville, Roy Keane and Carragher and Ian Wright, et cetera, and, and, and Jill Scott having a chat. And some of the guests are brilliant. But I go, whoa, there was a real opportunity. I still think there is. You know, we've had conversations about stuff, watch this space. But I still think that... Yeah, it, 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 it missed the boat because people were probably siloing themselves off in, into things. And then whilst being siloed off, internal factors hit everybody. You know, I look at AFTV, uh, you know, very sad with Claude. Mm -hmm. um, I think troops went to America, the DT fallout, and there was many others. Um, I look at, you know, we've spoken about what happened with the kickoff and it wasn't just you know, that end, you know, Hugh Wizzy was on there as well. He left as well. Other people, you look at United Stand, people left. And really there was probably a strength in numbers, but people just wanted to silo off. Obviously also people see business opportunities or people think, well, I could do this, but on my own. Sometimes they can. Showbiz, as I said at the start. Yeah. Um, the, the people are looking at everyone else's role and actually going... See, I always looked at the budgets, you know, you mentioned Ladbrokes and I always look at that and go, you know, I heard that number. I was like, wow, that is absolutely life changing money. It's massive. What could you do with that? But then actually I think, well, that's nothing to Coronation Street or Sky Sports or TNT. And then you've got somebody who's getting numbers that are bigger than any individual on Sky Sports or at that time. I mean, Gary, ne Gary Neville has good numbers. Let's, let's be fair. But at that time, no. So you've got an individual like, you know, the kickoff or whatever the numbers are massive and yeah the deal's great but what the mainstream are doing massive massive numbers and you just think you know what somebody there needed to go hold on a minute there's a collective here that can feed everybody and nobody ever did it and i think so, that that now that's probably not going to happen we tried to have some of those conversations i think getting a collective together is always hard ball street tried to do it obviously Fremantle tried to do it a lot of the time you find people's interests can don't converge in the right way also, people just keep wanting a bigger and bigger share of the pie mm. because they want to grow their own thing or they want to buy a house or a car or whatever. Were you led by the creative or were you led by the money as a, as a, as a group? Because um, this is a big question that we get thrown at us and I'm sure everyone watching will go, oh, you know, they just want to make money out of the club, which is hilarious. What do you think Sky Sports want to do? What do you think Adidas want to do? What you know, nobody's in, nobody's no, funding anything at what Sky unless it makes money. What, yeah. what does Bruno Fernandes do? What does yeah. what does what does Trent Alexander Arnold do? Nobody's in football to just go take my time for free. You know, everybody's got to earn a wage, but it is something that's levelled at content creators. I certainly know ones who look at it and go, "I'm going to copy that title from the kickoff. I'm going to copy that thumbnail. Oh, funny face! It's a disgrace. Let's hope I can grow." There's no they don't have a plan. Like when I came into it, as I said on that Lilo, I didn't know there was any money in this. I was just sort of like, I love football. Let's do that. And you know, the, the, the finances are there. But to me, if somebody would said to me four years ago, Loz, Brian, Robbie want to sit down and do 
what has now become thing. The, yeah. the thing that, that, that they do on the overlap. I'd go, where are we doing it? Yeah. Once or twice a week, yeah, where are we doing it? And I would have, I'd have done it. And I still would because the creative is the key for me and the money will follow. You'd hope the money follows. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I think there's also like, th there is a pressure in the space, especially uh, pressure in our channels to make money because you have to pay oh, someone to weird. edit. We have to do these things. I hate it. No, uh, I, don't, I, don't hate pay, I don't hate paying people, but, no, but it, the responsibility is a killer. Again, I didn't want to do that. Um, I think we've all witnessed times where we've had to tighten our belts a little bit or whatever. And if you haven't, then you're probably because you're on the way up rather than, you know, on the way down. I couldn't or, have a pudding the other day at this Michelin star restaurant. Right. I mean, that I think is, nurses have it hard. It's genuinely, that's, um, what did you want? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It was about, it was about 60 quid and it was only about that big, but I was just like, I'm worth it. Yeah. And I wasn't, I, I was like, mm, if I do that, my producer might not get paid again. Wow. And he would genuinely just, uh, what, leave? He or? coped well last yeah. month, but I think, you know. It's tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Financial times are That's going to get clipped and they're going to go, look at him. Put it this way. Like, I, I reflected a lot after we did our initial podcast. I think everyone thinks if they were in the space, in I think everyone thinks if they were in our shoes, they'd act and make perfect decisions. <laughs> and it's very easy to um, just go, well, if I had my own big YouTube channel, I would just do this and then this and then I'd collaborate with this guy and then we get up there and again it comes down to like the relationships so if four years ago you'd suggested to Robbie that he collaborate with Brian and I and you Robbie would go well I don't like Loz or I don't like what he said about me there oh yeah maybe. I don't like what Brian said about this I don't like Mark because he's running a channel that I want to be able to run and we'd all go well I don't really like Robbie because yeah. and Maybe we've grown into that, you know. I think, but I think most of the time, here's the thing. If you get in the room with people, yeah, most of the time you like them. Most of the time you get on with them. There's very few people I've met from YouTube where I'm like, that guy I'm not sure is a good person. There are a few, but there's not that many people. The fact is, YouTube is kind of, at the moment, a platform that forces people down certain avenues of content creation. And it doesn't, it does offer you a lot of creative space but it also doesn't offer you a lot of creative space. It depends on what kind of relationship you have with your audience. Yeah. Like you're sometimes you just, there is a grind that you have to go through, but that can really back you into a corner of cool. When I come to your channel, I'm just expecting you to tell me about Manchester United miserable, you know, bad news because I've grown up in a bad news, Manchester United era. And actually when you don't do that, I don't want to watch. And that's like... Yeah, you, you can see that with the numbers as well. Definitely. Like, you know, I know when the numbers are going to go up and I know when they're going to go down. I know when it's, you know, I know I know the times. It's seasonal. It's like Christmas shopping. I can tell when things are going to go like this and that. And I know when a story comes out and I know we've got to do that. And I'm not telling you on this show because Why ultimately not? people have nicked enough from what I've but done. But you have to anticipate. What you've done. But, but part, of your, part of your job is reading trends. Part yeah. of your job is is to go, oh, this, thing, this thing's interesting and that's going to gain traction in the next 24 hours. I'm going to cover it now and I'll be part of that wave of, of content. So if, you know, say you hear that, I don't know, like, you know, Liverpool might be bought or whatever, you'll go, okay, I'm going to try and get ahead of that and cover that before TalkSport do, before these guys do, before all those guys do. That's a trend, that's a, a skill to be able to read where the story goes. I would love to, as a project, and I probably will do it at some time, is find somebody who's talented, uh, who hasn't got the big numbers yet, and just produce them in sure. the sense that, like... You'll exec it, basically. You can, you can look at other content creators and their thumbnails and their titles and you will get so far but there is a talent on and I'm not going to mention it on this show and if someone wants to pay me to do it I will help them out because it is a skill and you know it is and, and Robbie will know it and everyone else knows it I know what story and how quick to react to it and you know it, 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 it it's really rewarding when you do that which feeds into something else I wanted to ask I mean you were going to say something well I was just going to say um I got five years of hospital radio. No one listened to me. Mm. No one, you know, not not because no one wanted to. I'm they were sure, sick. I'm they sure were the people well, on they the had wards. They all worries. Yeah, I'm sure the people on the wards hemorrhoids. were fiending for... Yeah. Here. No, no, it was, we, we, we wouldn't go out to the hemorrhoids. We worse would, than that. Yeah, way worse than that. Well, yeah, exactly. Like, you You've know, got other things were, to worry about. Um, we couldn't play My Way by Frank Sinatra, put it that way, because that's a song to die to. Yeah. Um, Did they tell you to put it on sometimes just because, you know, they needed the beds? Going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if I listen back That's to those... That's comedy. Read Richard Gervais. If I listen back to those shows, 
which I think I've still got some of the recordings somewhere. And if I go back to my first football YouTube video, which I've still got. Oh, I've got mine. Fuck. I'm, I've seen yours. Right. There are, yeah, but there's there's ones before that. Other ones. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Well, I had access to your, the all of your old videos at one point oh, when I was yeah. editing. But there's some on little... private that you won't have got. No, I, I, I saw the private one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On United Stand? Yeah. Fuck. You yeah. look... You look and sound so different. The tone, the pacing, all self-taught. But you learn that over time, right? And, that, and and credit to those people who come in now because they're not doing what I did for the first year. Right. Maybe they've got people to learn from, but I think the talent that comes through now, they do hit the ground running a lot better than I did at the start. And uh, uh, so that that leads into two, two things, right? First of all, there are, you know, now you don't know when you're going to blow up. You might have a viral clip and you're essentially told in the industry capitalize, get in there. And it's like, you're an 18 year old who mm. is still trying to learn their craft and no one calls it a craft, but speaking in front of cameras, a craft speaking mm. and having a message as a craft, like treat it seriously, you know, honor what it is that you do, because if you do want to do it for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and I'm not saying you just want to do a fan channel or whatever, but you want to be in video making and video creation, treat it seriously. Don't just go, okay, I'm just going to throw this up and I'm going to maybe not be serious. Of course, have fun with it. Of course, it, but you don't know when you might blow up. To an extent, that's not always a good thing. Like it's hard. I think it's hard. To commissioners blow up now. back in the day would go, "Is this guy ready? Let's sit down. Look this guy in the eye." And you know, I mean, I hate to use it as an example, but you know, the Jimmy Savile uh, dramatization with um, uh, what is the guy who plays Alan Partridge? Coogan. Yeah. There's the BBC. The commissioner sits down with him and he goes, "We're going to make a big show. Who do you think it should be?" And he goes, "I think it should be me." Mm. And that they look him in the eye and they kind of go, is he the right guy? TikTok and YouTube and those guys, when you're blowing up, don't really sit down and go, is he the right guy? Is that going to work for us? And maybe that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's democratisation of it. That sort of comes into the future of it, doesn't it? Because I think it's so easy now. The cameras are so good to go, oh, Mbappe is the best player in the world. You know, uh, Neymar's the most, he's just a Brazilian Marcus Albrighton. And yeah, you might well get some clips from that. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've seen it. Yeah. But what does that do for the content creator? What does that do for the, the whatever we're, the community that we're building? It lowers the expectation. It lowers the expectation and, and it yeah. fills the pond and it dilutes it, which is where I think we're at at the moment. And, and, I, and I think, you know, to an extent, the kickoff became culpable of doing that for a while 100%. where there was a lot of like well. clickbaiting. I know I like, People like often clip me up from things I said in the kickoff or whatever, which is hard now because I think the video's gone. But like, you, they clip me up from things at the Have time. Have they been taken down? I think so. I that's what someone told me the other day, but I didn't really it's weird have weird when people do that. I didn't go and check. Put it that way. Could still earn a bit of revenue off it. Probably, probably if you're having whatever words it is, it's probably really CPM-y. But like, the point is, um, people would clip up and go, "Oh, this this guy's a dickhead," or "This guy is that." Sometimes we were playing it up for the cameras because you know. After, after the show, we'd all go, good show, well mm. done. Sometimes you genuinely just get sucked into an argument. And well, it's like that clip you did, which I think you mentioned last time is the biggest one, was my my name reveal. Yeah. I can't remember whether I knew that was going to happen, but it was definitely staged. It was definitely, I think we asked you before the show and said, are you um, comfortable talking about your personal life? Yes. And there was like an allusion to the fact that your name wasn't a real name, whatever. Yeah. Or it was like a, what do you call it? A student? Uh, I can't remember the name. A student? Stage name. Yeah, stage name. And uh, we were like, cool, can we talk about that on the show? And you were like, yeah, fine, talk about whatever you want. And then I think it became a bit of a more engineered moment because we just didn't want to mid live show go, of course, you're not really the person you say you are. And, you know, make it look like someone was staging something. I think that that's not unusual, though. I mean, when I go on Talk Sport as a guest or when I used to go on Sky or anything like that, I mean, it's very, very common. You you know, we're going to talk about this, this. Are you comfortable with that? You know, they're, they're very careful that's about that. Professional. It's very professional. Whereas what I do and what we're doing, we don't have a script and we're just we're just riffing, yeah. um, which is which is which is great. But I think that you know, I want to move into, I definitely want to answer the question whether we, whether we, we think that what has been created is a good thing. And I definitely want to talk about the future, but one of the big things that sort of feeds into all of this and the cycle and everybody's been through it is of course that there's every, every, I think the only one that probably hasn't, and that's just so inoffensive and maybe that's a bad thing is red men. They don't seem to have the drama of people leaving or anything. They've been together fair play for a long, long time. And, and I do. They're like, very thick. Yeah. I, I like, as in thick as thieves, I, I like them. Dumb. Um, 
I think they should be bigger than they are because they've been around longer. I think um, they their private platform is very big for them. So yeah. their like paid platform is yeah, quite got big. The, yeah, and that helps them that. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think obviously you can always make more money. But again, you know, the difference between being it's a business... It's the way they do their content as well. It's very... They're very... They do a style of content yeah. and fair play to them and they've been around for years and they're good lads. Um, but I, Can I just say, I think Paul is Paul is such a talented guy and, so, and Chris is such an intelligent guy. I, I do actually agree. I think they should have a bigger platform. Well, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know Paul as well as Chris. I, I really I really get on well with Chris because this stuff we've done together. They're but, both lovely but, guys. But yeah, but they are. They, they are. They're a That's part of the reason they're, they're doing well, by the way. Because they're, they're just good people. They are. They're a credit to, the, to, to what we do. But apart from them, I think everybody, everybody has had this, you know, um, fallout. disintegration, fallout, people leave. And a lot of people ask me about this all the time. I thought, well, sod it, we'll do it on here because, you know, the, the last video did well and, and hopefully a lot of people will appreciate this. I've got an interesting take on this because there's probably, I mean, I, I, I lose count. There's probably up to 10 people that have left the United Stand. There's probably over... about six prominent names that have left the United Stand yeah, and yeah. probably about 10 people who've left and gone on and done other things. Yeah, And, and I'm always curious because some of them are very big names that have left and uh I, I to be honest because you don't talk about it people don't really know where the relationship's at so i'm yeah, kind of yeah. curious as to what your relationship is like and whether you just treat it all the same or whether you know there are some people who maybe it hurt a little bit more I, or... every single one hurt for different reasons are um, there anywhere can i just ask this off the top where you thought i should have handled that differently and i've made a mistake here well, I'm a very self-reflecting person, so you know I, I don't reflect that probably on the camera. There is a there is a shield, an arrogance. Uh, you know, uh, people call it whatever they like, but the reality is I'm I'm very loyal both in my life, uh, professionally and privately, and family, and I'm very trustworthy. So it hurts. It hurts when people leave because I really passionately believe we're building something, and every part of the puzzle I believe you are building part of something. I've never brought somebody in where I thought that'll do for six months. So. Um, you think, well, why did they leave? You know, what, what, did they not feed into that? So you, you I'm always going to self-reflect. Um, and some people hurt more than others because I was closer to them. Um, and some of the stuff they did and have subsequently done really hurts. Some it of the stuff I've heard said about you and um, when we did our podcast, a few people asked me what you were like. And I told you on the podcast, name of people ask what you're like anyway. But a few people like, asked me really weird questions. Like, yeah. you know, do you think Mark's bigoted? Or yeah. things like that. Yeah. And I found that really bizarre. Well, I, Knowing you, yeah. I went, what? Well, well that's really weird, isn't it? I think that's a really weird thing to assume about someone. But because because I, mean, I, I sort of get it, because the, a lot of the people that we've brought into the United Stand, it's been ridiculously diverse. Right. You know, you look at someone like Beth, there's not many female prominent people in... Who get, who get taken seriously yeah, and don't just get told shows, and don't yeah. just get patted on the head and yeah, kind of go, yeah. thanks a lot for that, love. Yeah, and um, we had someone called Zara years ago who now works for MUTV and used to work with Gary Neville. So we've always been ridiculously diverse. But when those people leave, people go, oh, he it's must because have, yeah, he because hates that. women or he hates... I've only, I've only yeah. sacked one person and, it, and it's not the person that people would think it is. Right. Um, and it wasn't really a sacking. It just wasn't working out. And that right. person was actually hands up I'm not happy. So the, everybody else left of their own accord. Um, and I think with some of those people and, and certainly the community, there is this perception that, oh, Galbridge is hard to work with and this, that and the other. And, and there's all sorts of comments been made. And, you know, sometimes I can say something and go, you know, there's that there's people out there that will be not set. We will be celebrating that we lost because of Ten Hag. And then, Content creators will think I'm talking about them. I right. don't watch your content. I, I don't watch your content. And then it's very. I, I always find it so sweet. Yeah. When um, someone says like, "I can't believe you're having a go at me for that," and I'm like, "With all due respect, I I don't know who you are." Well, or you, I you or Brian could do it at the weekend. You could say, you know, I mean, look, Rory's recently said that Mbappe is not world class, and you I, could you, could, along those lines, you yeah. could get into a conversation where you go, I can't believe somebody wouldn't think Mbappe is world class. That would that that might not be because of Rory. You know, yeah. it might not be. So I've had a lot of that happen. Um and look, bottom line, I don't watch anybody else's content because it would hurt to watch their content because they they were part of what we've done. So how I deal with it in, in a short answer is that everybody's had this. Robbie's had it. You've had it. Everybody's had it apart from the red men. And it, I look at it and I go, 
I'm not exclusive. It happens to everybody. I go back to that conversation I had with the celebrity, the, the, the actor in, in COVID. And, you know, he talks to me about showbiz and I go, unfortunately, that's just it. You, you bring somebody in, they feel they can do better. They go off and do, and do what they want to do. But can I also say, obviously, because you're a big face of a channel, it does make it hard for another face to grow in the same way as you or to be as big as you on the channel. Because a lot of people do associate yeah. you with that and they come for you. That's fair enough, right? But Gary Neville's got this problem as well. You had this problem. I don't want that. I, I just want to be a creative. If somebody, if there was three of me, I've got a third of my week off. But that's, that's, so, but the thing with that is that is a very slow process to be able to hand that off. Like even when I joined And we've Brian, never got there. But even when I joined Brian at True Geordie, people were like, who's this guy? And then you go through a bit of a window where people don't like you. And then you go through a window where people like you. That was like years it yeah. took for people to get to know personalities and those kind of things. And I, I got an email today which said, I sent you an email. You didn't reply. We should be working together because I know I'll be massive. And I was like, Okay. Forward it to me. Cool. Yeah. I looked at his channel. I was like, yeah, this is a nice channel. Like, but it, you've got a thousand subscribers and I think I've got other things I want to work on right now. People are going to look at the United Stand or Mark Goldbridge or any of those channels you've got and go, I've got some ideas about this and I want to do it my way. And then when they come to you and go, I want to do this and you go, I don't really know if that fits the channel. Yeah. And that it, happens. Then if, right, that's fine. Yeah. But you're not being difficult to work with there. You're just saying, I know what vision I've got for my business that pays the bills and pays wages. I can't just go tomorrow. We're just going to change our entire business model because someone wants to do a video that they've had a, a you know, brainwave for. Mm. That's not the way it works. No, that's and, a good point. you know, that the BBC do, doesn't just go around. I'm, you know, I hate the BBC or whatever. It's just a commissioning body. You know, they don't just go around and go, do you want a show next week? Cool. Uh, you go over there. Cameras are over there. See what you get. Like they meticulously plan the content that comes out because you have to, because people are expecting a certain standard or a certain level of like banter, analysis, jokes, all these kind of things. And that's not the very top of what you're capable of, but it's what they're expecting. So you can't just, if someone says, well, I want to go and do fan cams or I want to talk about United in this way, sometimes it's best for you to go, maybe you should do that on your own channel. Or maybe you should do that. If you want to make an entity, go and make it. I, I, I just think, you know, it's a great point because when, when we look at about the future of, of, of this um, and what we've built collectively in this, in not just as everybody, of course, um, I look at it and I go, look, you, you asked me about mistakes. I never wanted to be Alan Sugar, as I said. I wanted to be a creative. And because it grew and money started coming in and you start recruiting people and you start going, let's give them a chance. Let's give them a chance. It's more, you know, I, 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 I'm I, down making content. I can't look above and go, are we nurturing that talent? Sure. Could we do this? Could we do that? You know, it's three shows a day. It's a, I mean, a fair play for people who do it. Fair play for any content creator, actually. And you're right. I think people go, Looking back, oh, I'm, only, I'm only doing one show every couple of days. He's doing he's doing he's doing three a day. Where, where's my piece of the pie? And then you know people get in their ear and go, yeah, you could probably be doing that. So look, the point is they the point is they could be doing that, and they do, and they do do that, and that's that's the way the industry works. Mm. Is that you are you you know when they leave, I'm sure you're sad or you know obviously it's nice to have links with people and it's nice to work with people, but it's not. It's the, it's the lack of conversation, I think, for me. The communication and, and, and you, is so You key. spoke about that with, with the lads with the kickoff. Absolutely, you didn't yeah. see it come in and they went and did it. And I understood why they did it. And I, I understand why people have left me and I understand why people have left Robbie and everything. I, I can see why they've done it and they're earning their own thing and, that, and they're working hard and that's absolutely fine. Sure. I do regret that they didn't just come and say... I'm thinking of doing this. So that's uh, what I that's what I would have, have loved to have had. And I, you know, I'm I've tr I've tried to have conversations with those guys since, and that hasn't really happened because I think they were maybe a little bit annoyed or mm. felt blindsided by just me sort of coming out and saying something, which is fair enough. Um, but I, but that's the therapy for you. You know, I read a lot of those comments, and, and uh, you know, I did the interview, and I know you, and it's like it was we. I never wanted. I mean, look, I reached out to Brian. He didn't come back really sad about that because he's reached out to me about other stuff in the past. I've reached out to him really sad because that whole interview was actually for you as somebody that I like and respect. Right. And I wanted you to have your say. And we both said before, we don't want to 
cause an issue for the club guys or for Brian. And I don't think we did. But you have to tell a story. Otherwise, you are perceived in a certain way, which is unfair. And, and that's that- why I said you were the biggest loser. And people are like, oh, that's really horrible. But I think you were. I think, yeah. I in, think, in a professional sense. And that, I guess, the other piece of advice, I, there were plenty of people who were looking for advice last time or like kind of like, oh, I want to work in the industry. Yeah. I think... We'll cover that in the future bit a, as well. Approaching things with like a true heart or, you know, that's when you're speaking about people leaving. A lot of the time they're leaving because there is an ego element in there or of like, um, or an anger element. Those things never really serve you all that well. No, like no. if you're creating in resentment or you're making videos and you're resenting someone, it becomes really hard to yeah. make those videos. Yeah. And I think, you know, towards the end of what happened with Brian and I, you could see there was a tension to what was going on. I'm not saying we weren't friends, but I'm saying like, you can see sometimes when people aren't happy. And when I look back at that person, I kind of look at that person and go, I don't really relate to that person in the same way anymore. You know, I'm sure I was difficult to work with. Brian was very difficult to work with at times. So uh, it was difficult sometimes when people turn up late from, uh, you know, our uh, ensemble cast of people. Mm. Like all these things are difficult things. And you'd love it if it could be ideal. But if you can be an understanding, empathetic person, that's going to get you way further. And that's not to be a yes man. You don't have to sit there and go, yeah, I'll go and do whatever you want. And yeah, can I get you more tea and be mm. a, you don't need to be a lackey. You just need to be someone who can sit down and go, what's going on? Mm. Like, you know, how can we work this out? How can we, how can we make this better? Yeah. But, but being a good communicator is really hard. So can I ask you, do you like, what do you like about where football YouTube is at at the moment? Okay. Um, I will answer that. I want to close the other two things that are close in my head. Close it. Okay. So in, in in relation to people leaving and stuff, I think you made a great point about anger. I think naturally people leave something. They want to leave, but then they have a lot of them take the resentment of why they're leaving. You've made the reason to leave. You haven't communicated that reason. You've gone. And then when you go, you take resentment. I, that's something I don't understand. And I see it across the industry. Um, you know, I, I'm not naming any names at all. It could be AFTV, it could be the club, it could be United Stand. But sure. they, they make a decision to go, don't necessarily communicate why. And I think that damages them because they obviously go for a reason, but they don't communicate the reason. And then they take the reason and feel resentment. And I think that is never a good thing because it never does you any good. No. My answer to anyone who's left the United Stand is, yeah, it did hurt variously, various people. And I did learn from it. But honestly... If I'm being completely honest, the positive I take is that I think everybody should do this in life is that everything happens for a reason, but it's not that fairy nonsense. It's actually, I look at all those people who've left what I did and I look at where they were at the start and they weren't there. Yeah. I'm not going to, you say you gave them the chance and you created them and people go, oh, what you're trying to say is there'd be nothing without you. Well, that's a really harsh thing to say because they've got talent and that's why they came along in the first place. But. I do look at it and I go, every single one of them, whatever they're doing, did have a talent and at some point had a relationship with us and are now elsewhere. And whether they want to acknowledge it or not, I personally look at it and go, well, that's a positive of the United stand is that all those people actually started here and they can never change that. They did. And their initial boost in views and what they're getting now was because they were on the United stand. That's not me. Mm-hmm. That's the United Stand community. So I, I have to look at it like that. And that's how I sleep at night and move on from it. And if I hear that people are slagging me off or anything like that, well, I don't do that. And actually, I wish you all the best because it's really hard in this space it's space to do it. It's really hard to do it day to day. And I think that's how you have to deal with it because mm-hmm. you can't take resentment and anger. Um you know, there's been some brilliant people that I've worked with. And I tend to look, you know, it's a bit like when someone dies, isn't it? You know, I'm gonna sit there crying all the time. At some point you get to a point where you just go, Actually, I'm just going to look back at the good. And, you know, I've had that with friends away from this. I've had this with family members as well. There's a, you know, there might be a really toxic reason we don't talk anymore. Do I look back at that or do I look back at past Christmases and stuff like that and go, I remember that. I can't lose all the memories because of the end. Mm -hmm. It's easy, I think, um, to have a toxic approach. Um, I'll also say, I think YouTube channels um like put you through a bit of a mental ringer sometimes and they kind of i can see what stage people are at in their youtube life there's a cycle how they see youtube Mm. um and there was like the whole you know there was the everyone gets to a point where they think that they think their shit doesn't stink everyone gets to a point where they realize that's not the case and everyone gets to the point where they kind of have to 
cycle back a little bit or kind of go, actually, you know, I was just feeling that on that day or whatever. And that is, these are all like s symptoms of where your channel is at and what your audience, your relationship so with them true. is like and all these kind of things. And it's weird because I see it on a lot of other channels. I'm old enough now and have been through like three cycles of different YouTube cycles, personally experienced it, watch other people go through it. And I'd almost, what I get frustrated about is I watch a lot of people giving advice in our industry and it's quite empty truisms. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that those things are lovely. You know, they're very nice branded days of like, hey, come along and chat to this person about streaming. And but it's you've like- you've got to experience and, and not just experience, but also I watched what happened with you. I watched what happened with some of the stuff that happened at AFTV. They've had controversy about stuff with sponsors yeah. and stuff. And you look at it and you go, some people look at it and go, ha ha. And some people look at it and go, hmm, that's that's a vulnerability that we, you know, you learn from it, don't you? Also, I, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not st stupid enough to think that someone, someone doing like so AFTV and lots of different channels, they to a big media company that want to buy something or want to spend ad money are the same as me. Mm. That media company is not going to go, hmm, but sometimes Lawrence has an insightful moment. Do you know mm. what I mean? Sometimes Mark has a, you know, he's a bit funny sometimes, but he also is quite insightful. They're just going to go, Mark Goldbridge, AFTV. Yeah, Lawrence, I'm that's... not putting myself in the same level as you guys. You guys are massive. But, you know, yeah, there's no differential. Them, we're all the same. So it's not great, actually, when we all fall out or everyone has beef or no. there's this big moment because those people see that and go, God, oh, those guys can't just like shut up and keep it moving a little bit. Like we sort of need something to invest in here. That is a problem for us because we don't have like, a, you know, in Hollywood, they have like a guild and all the actors get together. And as much as they might not like each other, there are friendships in that room. And, you know, there are people who are represented by the same agent and go for lunch together and, you know, there's Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and those guys are friends. And those, and I'm sure there's bigger friendship groups than two, <laughs> but you get my point. Like we don't give ourselves enough respect, I think, for what we do. And that's not me. Okay. Now. Grandma. And that's not me saying um, we should, oh, you know, we should, if we go, we're amazing, but we should at least, I feel like we miss out on a lot mm -hmm. because we don't respect enough what we do. And we just see it as like, a, some people, are just, it's just a job. Uh, as I said, it just goes back to what I've mentioned on the previous video on this one. There's so many missed opportunities because, you know, pe you know, people are trying to go and get this bit of talent to supplement them and this bit of talent to supplement them. And actually there was something with going, you're talented, I'm talented, we're talented, let's do something together. Even if it's once a week, we'll smash it out of the park. Yeah. And it's funny, actually, when you talk about, you know, experiences, because... Um, we had a really bad day on Sunday, really bad on the United stand, very unfair in relation to the Rasmus Hoyland interview and it went everywhere. And the so what, what happened with that? So basically we did the interview with Rasmus a few weeks ago. That went, as far as I was concerned, really that, was a, that well. was a big success, wasn't Millions it? Millions of views. Really good. Club did well, player did well. Rasmus seemed really happy. Rasmus really happy. Right. We were really happy. You know, really innovative in, in relation to, I know Red Men again have done interviews. Other people have done interviews, but it was just very unique around our type of content and it worked really, really well. And, and also... It was big for you guys in that sense of like, it takes a long time to get through to Manchester United. Yeah, it took months. Like, it takes a while. Yeah. And, and then you had an article come out which basically said the players were in up, up, up in outrage. Really? You know, Rasmus apologised for doing it and it just made it feel like... Was that a big outlet that said that? No, it's, it was a fanzine. Oh. But, it, but, it, but it's a respected fanzine. And it's really? a good fanzine and it's a good journalist and it came out... Why and did they do that then? Did you Have you ever had contact with those people? No, no. I mean, I, I don't really know. I, I said jealousy on Sunday, but it, I wasn't aiming it at them. I was aiming it at all the aggregators who instant... It didn't need to go as big as it did, but it went as big as it did because there's a lot of aggregators out there who went, and mainstream, who went, here we go, let's get it. They in. also know they can click... If you put yeah. Mark Goldbridge and you get Manchester United, there's loads of fans who go... He did something wrong. And I don't understand to the extent of why, because ultimately, even if it was true, it would be a couple of players leaking out that they were furious that Rasmus did an interview. Why does that end up with death threats and, you know, abuse death and everything threats. like that? Well, you know, you know what yeah. Twitter's like. I mean, I, I don't take it seriously. But I mean, yeah, you can get a death threat in football for, for like nothing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and anyway, so it, it was it was massive and cancel Goldbridge and all this stuff. And I still I did a video on Sunday night and I said, look, truth is, it takes months to get an interview like that. 
Truth is, we were in Carrington for hours. Truth is, I was walking past other United players, smiling at them. Truth is, Rasmus openly walked into the room. Truth is, we already knew a couple of players were a bit uncomfortable with it. Truth is, there's a... Really? Li- that, yeah, yeah, just but not in the way that don't do it. Just a yeah. little bit like he's given me a bit of shit in the past. Right. But not everyone in the dressing room gets on anyway. Truth is, Man United are a big club. They've got a media list. Everyone can see what everybody's doing. TNT, Tr- everything like Manchester that. Manchester United let you into the building. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like you were like crept in. So we did it. And I said, look, there's probably a couple of players that weren't happy with it. But if they'd said to Rasmus, you're not doing it, he would have said, I am doing it. And because that's just how footballers are. Um, anyway, we got loads of shit for a couple of days. On Monday, everyone I'm working with, I'd say 75% of them, a couple of them were crying. Like, you know, really, you know, bothered by the shit they were getting on, on social media. Because they worked hard to get to yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, mainly because they were upset about something they'd worked hard to do. And I said, tomorrow will be a great day. Today is a bad day. Stop interacting with people on Twitter. Get off your phones. Get out and touch grass. Tomorrow's going to be a great day. Uh, I came here. I did my podcast. Hello, welcome to Goldbridge Safe. You know, all this. Um, and went to bed at night absolutely exhausted. You know, you've got everyone else's emotions. You've got your own emotions. Next day, brilliant day. And that's experience that is experience. You can have the world on your shoulders and think this is, I don't want to do this anymore. And then the next day is a new day. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's, that's, that's an experience that I think you get, that you have from, you know, being in this, this it's, there's so much that goes on behind the camera. Basically there's so much that goes on, you know, the politics, the blocking, the, the, the vile nature of some people to try and stop you doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I, the reason I mentioned that is because people say, you know, what advice would you give? If you put yourself on camera, the biggest advice, you are going to get hate. You you are. And and don't start moaning about it because people will say, well, you put yourself on camera quite rightly. You know, you've got to have the courage of your convictions because you will be treated badly. I think sharing that experience and moaning about it are two different things. So I think, you know, saying uh, I don't like people hating me is perfectly reasonable. It's perfectly reasonable as a human to go, when you give me hate, it makes me feel not good. Mm. It's not good to go, I should be able to say whatever I want and do whatever I want and you can't react. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. Mm. And I think people don't quite understand the way that comments work or like YouTube works. Like people think I'm going to leave a comment and that's just true. And then if you reply, then you have, you, you're have you weak for replying. Whatever. It's a really weird, like the internet is a really weird place and you can't, I don't know what someone else is, why someone else is commenting whatever they're commenting. I don't know why someone is going to say cancel Goldbridge or, you know. Sunday's always the worst day as well. I because there's a weekend. lot of people sitting around. Yeah. They've yeah. got to go back to work tomorrow. And they're maybe a bit drunk. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, Sun- Sunday's frustrated. always been the day that if you want to get off social media, get off social media. Because- also, in the United space, bad day on Sunday because yeah, they're not the focus. Yeah. You know, Liverpool City, mm. massive game, yeah. you know. A United really relevant in that game? What at was all? the question you were asking me before? I was just saying, are United relevant at no, all no, in the no, title it race? It's about the, this, uh, the content of the video. Yeah. So, um, are you like talk to me a little bit about uh, where this, where you understand YouTube and just kind of online football to be at now? Um, I'm a bit confused by. I mean, I, as I said, I'd say for the last two years, I've not really been happy. Um, I love the content. That's the content is king. I love the content. Um, and I don't think I could walk away. You know, I have thought about walking away, not because I didn't think about walking away on Sunday. That makes me go, I'm not walking away. Like my wife will say, maybe it's time. And I'll go, I'm not walking away on, a, on, on, I'm not being bullied out of it. So you're saying the nicer people are to you, the more likely you are to walk away. Yeah. I think the Klopp mm. thing, I might just, that, that's the dream to go out on the positive. Having rebuilt yeah, the yeah. team. I, yeah, yeah. Some people walk out on the negative and I'm like, mm, I don't want to do that. Um, but look, maybe I will. I don't know. But I, I, I think I, the reason I'm unhappy about it is because I'm probably sort of hitting so many ceilings. Like I don't want to run a business. I don't want to run a business and I do run a business. Um, I want to do things I get blocked off from doing. Like talk sport's been a massive frustration for me because what mm. I what I signed up to do, I've not been able to do. Is that and is that like company politics or is that like? I think it's a combination of things. I mean, look, there will probably be more about that in the future yeah um i mean I, I there's so many good people at talk sport i love doing my video I i've lo- got to admit like yeah for a, for a place that does have a lot of um like you know obviously a lot of people get a lot of hate clips from talk sport yeah stuff they're so nice oh they're brilliant the producers the producers yeah are lovely people yeah and there's some brilliant people in there and i and i think it's 
you know, it's got so much potential, which sounds a bit negative, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a frustration considering that was a crossover to have your own radio show. I think there was so much more that could have been done. Um, and in general, I think the mainstream media still has a massive grip on football and it's a blocker. Um, I think there's people within what we do who are blockers and I'd love to break those things down. I'd love to do more creative content. I've had ideas for years that we've discussed as well. So I find it, I look at, I look at the future of it and I go, well, look, I can keep doing this for five years. Do I want to do it for five years? I find it hard to stop, but I, I also find it hard to look at the next five years being the same as the last five years. Sure. So I, I don't know what my future is in it. I'm always looking for talent. I think that's that's a really, you know, I'd love to do that producer thing. I mean, I think I think I've I, uh, some of us know so much and can offer so much and and it, and it annoys me a little bit that people think that I'm the narcissist who just wants myself on camera. If anyone's worked with me, even the people who left, if they were honest, would say he was always trying to find a week off for himself mm -hmm. so that other people could step up. We just never got there. You seem to build people to a certain level and they go off. And that's a dangerous thing. And everyone's got that. AFTV's got it. You had it with the kickoff. It's hard to... The, higher, the, the, yeah. the closer they get to being the solution, the more light they, likely they are to go, I want my own thing. Well, there's also, you know, to an extent, sometimes... Um, you know, you're talking about not wanting to run your own business or you want to, you want to have a business, but you don't want to have to do every aspect of it, which I think is perfectly reasonable of, of what you're asking. But actually a lot of businesses get investment at different points. And then it's much easier to get people invested mm. because you can turn around to the people in your staff and go, all right, we've just had some investment. Everyone's going to get paid this now, you know, and that keeps people as part of the journey. Whereas, like you said, there's a lot of ceilings in what we do because YouTube CPM can only be so much sometimes yeah. or a sponsorship might end because you know they've got their money's worth or they just don't have the money anymore that can be difficult to keep that rolling uh and that's where like i think a lot of people don't understand with the overlap and things like that the overlap is like a very considered business model where those guys are going for investment and these kind of things and that's really smart but i wish there would be more people who would look i, th I hope that there'll be more people who look at what they do and go, well, if they did that, could we invest in Mark Goldbridge or something I, else? I love, I would, I, you know, I think with the United stand, it's, and I probably shouldn't be saying this on camera, but honestly, you know what? I think some sort of 50, 50 investment strategy to take it to that next level. I get a split of would, sorts. Would take a lot of the responsibility for running it off me to allow me to be creative, but also bring a load of ideas and to take it where it, I know where it can go. I cannot be two people. A huge part I cannot of, do it. A huge part of production, and I think why a lot of people go, well, I, I could be Steven Spielberg or whatever. It's Spielberg is obviously an incredible um, per person for what he's achieved in his life and a visionary. But he was surrounded by a team of people yeah, who he enabled him. Like he didn't animate Jurassic Park himself. It's impossible. And he didn't. You know, he obviously goes out there and finds funding. But he's an incredibly well connected guy. I think that's part of it. Is it's the mental battle of being. Like, and we had this with the kickoff and with True Geordie and I even have it now. It's like the days where I'm not feeling or I'm like, God, I've got to do some business. I've got to do invoicing or all this stuff to then go, right, now let's go and film a video. That's quite a, a challenge. So if you do want to get into media or you do want to do this, that is a big part of it is the balance of those two things. And then also balancing being a dad or being a boyfriend or being yeah. a husband or just having your own time. That's a big challenge, I think. And I don't want sympathy for it because people will be watching this going, oh, it must be really hard. No. That's not what you're we're, saying. We're not talking sympathy. We're talking barriers, like sure. bandwidth. If there was an, a, a, a robot of Goldbridge who could present the shows, I'd just become a producer or the other way around. That's the ideal. And I think it can only really be achieved by, you know, some sort of investment or merger or, you know, I think that I think that's that's potentially the future. What's the future of the space is intriguing. Um, I think I'm watching the space. I mean, I'm in very interested in what we might work on. Um, I'm very interested in, you know, there are still some big hitters that could make an, I'm still looking for talent to come in, which, which I think that's really difficult. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's still really interesting to me that the vast majority of talent has been around for coming up a decade yep. and the talent that's coming through really is a bit pigeonholed in the sense that sure. they're, they're all doing the same sort of thing. I think there's some interesting people out there, but I don't think they've got, you know, it's almost like the Everton interesting. I can't see a Liverpool coming through at the moment. I think that's really interesting as well. But I would love to get back to where I think it was heading probably three or four years ago, pre-COVID, where 
I think we were going to take the mainstream on properly. And I think what's happened in the last 12 months, and I have to doth my hat to things like The Overlap and even Gary Lineker's podcast to a certain extent, is that they've capitalised on everything we were doing well and incorporated it into the I've played the game arena, which we were defeating. And look, I think it's only half time. I think there is a second half. If you, if I was predicting it, it really depends on whether again, people are going to be open enough to have conversations because we're stronger together and we're weaker apart. And at the moment, I still think people are funneling off in their own little things. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's interesting because um, I think at the moment there is a lot of, there are a lot of talented people um, who are kind of making content that maybe they think their audience want to watch rather yeah. than some. It, also, passion projects, sometimes they're good, they are good enough that they hit and it's like, cool, that's, that's a really great, you know, cooking with Goldbridge, I can't imagine was like what you saw yourself doing initially. And then you went, this will be fun. I'm going to do that. Do you know what I mean? And you were kind of, you had the kudos to people go, oh, I want to watch him cook and talk about this. You can't, some people have to do the grind because there's nothing else for them to talk about or they don't feel they have the idea or the money or the execution to be able to do the rest. I feel like that's the stage right. It's like kind of like building up stage rather than a growth stage. Mm. There are some really great people in the space. You know, I think uh, Sharky and those guys are yeah. really great stuff. I like that, what they're doing, actually, because there's group, a collective. There's a great collective And I think it, 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 it's such a shame because I think there is a collective opportunity. You look, it's the side men model. You put six or seven people together. It is seven, I think. And they're all doing different things, but they're all doing stuff together. And I think that is basically what Stick to Football is doing now. And I think that's what we should do. Um just to sort of wrap it up a bit, the big question is, have we created a monster? We're not taking responsibility for this. I mean, you know, you can, throw you Robbie, throw Redmen. Did, if you go back to the origins, and you can all answer this, if you go back to the orange of fan community and where it is now, is it a good, bad thing? Or is it actually probably somewhere in between? I think it's uh, it, it's had massive good implications on people's lives. Hmm. I think it's definitely getting to a, you know what I think is good? It, it does hold the clubs to account sometimes. And yeah. I think that's partially why it's hard to get in some spaces because they don't want you to sit down and go, hold on a minute. Is that actually a good thing that the club are doing? They want, obviously it's a lot easier if on a daily basis, they just go, we've made this decision and everyone goes, cool. You know, is the team still going to go out there? The relationship has changed because of things like fan channels, because people feel more empowered to speak. That's good. This is a great point because I'll forget about it. I spoke to somebody about three months ago and it's not the first time it's been said. And they said, um, and if you take this for every AFTV kickoff, whatever, yeah. they said, you know what? One of the big things about the United stand is it's my kids support United. And I think they probably would have supported City, but they've seen me watching the United stand. They like the personalities. They like the way you do content. They like the way that it's every day. And it's a reason for them to be engaged in the football club that if you take all fan content away... Why are you supporting that football club? While well, I watch them on a Saturday, they lose. Um, I'm, not, I'm not reading the written press. I'm not watching Sky. You know, it, it, the, the power of fan content in that sense, and it never gets credit for it, in, in retaining and recruiting fans and making them daily passionate about their football club. I wish I'd had it when I was growing up. I think also that that's a big part of it is I think, do you know, it has kind of become a bit of a thing that if you want to be a fan, sometimes some people want to be a fan that is on camera. Mm. And I think some fans have taken a bit of a lead from the fans on camera. And that isn't always good because it, sometimes it's great. You know, it, it empowers some people who didn't think they could support Arsenal or whatever. I think it has dominated the space a lot. Like I remember when Arsenal and Robbie and those guys had their thing, a lot of people actually just laughed at them and didn't, yeah. and they were watching, like hate watching. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of sad because it soured a lot of Arsenal fans' experiences. AFTV and chill, wasn't it? Yeah. And they would like, it soured a lot of Arsenal fans' experiences because they're they were in a like, much better place now. Yeah. I don't think they're in a better place revenue and numbers wise, but I think as a Holistic. credible content creator they've I, I watch a bit of their content every now and again i agree and i think it's in a much better place yeah um, and that's uh, learning for and, and 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 you know what i'll i'll answer it do i think it's been a good or a bad thing i think it's been an amazing thing i think it's incredible that basically people who are not journalists and would never get a foot in the media because the media is a closed shop even now 
they, even now we're bigger than them. It's still a closed shop. So it was always going to be a closed shop if you went, That's can true. I come on to create something where basically, you know, people who never would have got on TV, never would have got to talk about football, who obviously have a voice that people want to listen to. To create that is an amazing thing. And anybody who's in this and watching this and part of this is absolutely, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. The negative is it's unregulated. The negative is, you know, it, it, it's unfiltered and mm -hmm. you can get opinions and words and avenues that you go down that are regrettable. I mean, I look at some of the things I've said and I, I do regret it. And I think, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that. And I wish I didn't say that, but you hope with time and experience that the, in the next few years, this is why I think the big hitters can be so influential by working together, but also by, you know, taking a responsibility for the, for the area that they created, stop living in a silo and start actually providing pathways for talent to come through. There's so much good work being done around diversity of, you know, all types of football fans from all around the world as well. You know, there's more American voices now, you know, that, that, that in football, which and they'll probably used to be stereotypically ridiculed, to be honest with you, if you're an American, uh, which is totally unfair. So and there's massive positives, but I also think there's, there's so much more to learn and people need to stop living in silos because there are definitely negatives. But overarchingly, I think it's amazing. I agree. I think um, it, it, the the potential still in where we're at is massive, um, and I'm, I think it gets realised in a way which isn't just a big company sponsoring a channel. Yeah, and I think that's really exciting for me because uh, we've done that kind of relationship, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more of those. Yeah, but I think it gets done in that like grey area, and that is way more exciting to me than like. You know, the overlap's very exciting, but it's not, it doesn't excite me in that sense. It It is their excitement. And I'm like, cool, that's good. It doesn't make me think, God, we're going to, we're going to see something really groundbreaking here. I'm excited for the groundbreaking stuff that is to come. I think that's like still very much on its way. And I, by the way, there are a few people that are doing really groundbreaking. I think, you know, Thogden on a weekly basis goes away and does some really weird videos. Yeah. I think um, Stumpeg goes away mm. and does videos that, you know, I just, I, I love them. I think they're really creative. And the same for Ellis and those guys. They're creative people. There's way more space for them to flourish. Yeah. And, and look, here's a lesson for you as well. You know, you can get really toxic and angry. And I think probably seven, eight years ago, I used to look at things and go, well, why is Brian doing that? Why, why is Robbie doing that? I don't do that. That's experience. You'll go through that stage though. I you think will. everyone goes through yeah, that yeah, stage. You've, you've got to go through it. But, you know, here's the example of I don't do it because I could look at the overlap and go, how the hell have we dropped the ball? And how the hell are they hitting 1.5 million views every video when they just sat there, Ian Wright, Jamie Carragher, Gary Neville? And I don't. I go... They're doing that. They're winning at the moment. How do we get back in front? Sure. Um, and it's not through that because when I look at their fan debates, fair play to the people who do it. You might do it. But I think there's just something wrong of watching Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher talking and then going, let's take a question from this Rory. And Rory goes, and I go, whatever you think about Rory, you're better than that. And I've got no problem with the overlap and Jamie Carragher doing it. It's really good content. It does really well. But I just think, are we losing here? It feels a little patronising sometimes, I think would be the, the broad feedback. and I'm Based on what we've done over the last 10 years. 10 yeah. years ago, if that was the content, we'd go, oh my God, they're talking to a fan. And that is brilliant. But I think in relation to what, you know, this video is, did we create a monster, you know, the story of football YouTube, it can't end with being sat behind Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville going like that. Here's, the way I'd say it is, I think in whatever YouTube channel you're going to create it's going to be a monster. Mm. I guess what you would like is that you get to pick its features. And at the moment, I sort of look at it and go, yeah, we could add some claws to that. Or like, oh, could it breathe fire? Yeah, yeah maybe that'd be cool. And at the moment, it doesn't quite have that like, it's not quite my Finnish monster, if I put it that way. 100%. Lars, it's been a pleasure. As Absolutely always. enjoyed yeah, it. We've probably me. gone way too long again, but lots for you to get your comments in. Make sure you smash a like and subscribe and uh, check out Lawrence's channel, which I didn't say last Thank time. You, yeah. This is Lawrence yeah. McKenna. I'm sure loads of people Googled it or searched for it. Know about anyway. it anyway. Yeah, yeah, they know, but yeah, obviously, yeah. Thanks, you know everyone. I, can I just say, I did really enjoy last time. Some people went, uh, oh, he's been gone for a year. And I was like, no, I've been up uploading. Yeah, this is, <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Yeah. I told you you were the biggest loser. <laughs> You're glowing up now. Uh, cheers, everyone. Uh, back with one of these hopefully very soon. Take care.